everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 164. This week the questions are taken from Guide 219 on HMS Tiger, that's the cruiser of 1945, not the battle cruiser of the 1910s, and the accompanying Wednesday video on German merchant raiders of World War II. Clemens Erhard asks, how effective was Tirpitz's AA during her service time, as it was constantly upgraded and they must have had plenty of opportunities to use it? Not that effective, actually, to be perfectly honest. They didn't upgrade any of the medium or heavy anti-aircraft batteries. They just stuck more 2cm or 20mm flak on it, which you know, is not really particularly brilliant against anything that's not coming right down to point-blank range. There's a certain amount of reasoning for this, in as much as by the time they were looking at seriously upgrading the ship's anti-aircraft capabilities... It was mostly being attacked in harbour by fleet air arm aircraft and then later RAF Lancasters. So it's not really facing much attack at sea, although it was occasionally attacked at sea uh, when the few times it actually went out and about. But when it was in harbour, Tirpitz's primary defences for a long time were shore-mounted anti-aircraft guns, land-based fighters and then smoke to try and conceal the ship. And this presents sort of a bit of a catch-22 for the ship's AA gunners. If you don't have the smoke screen obscuring the ship, the ship is a much easier target, but the anti-aircraft guns on the ship can fire back. But if you do have the smoke screen, there's a much higher chance the enemy won't be able to necessarily find or hit you in the first place. But also, you know, for visually tracked in guns, you're not really going to be able to shoot through that with any accuracy. You can just pop a blind barrage. Now, for an individual ship on its own, that's quite a difficult decision. For Tirpitz, it was l perhaps less of a dis difficult decision because you've got this shore-based support. So, as a result, the anti-aircraft guns didn't get too massively upgraded, apart from, say, more 20mm flak, and the overall losses suffered by fleet air arm attacks on Tirpitz before it switched over to Lancasters were relatively few, and most of them can be attributed to either Luftwaffe fighters or shore-based anti-aircraft guns, although Tirpitz's anti-aircraft battery did get a few. Paul Trigger asks, Were the crew of the Hilfskreuzer protected as combatants, or were they considered unprivileged in this circumstance because of the tactics that they used? The crews of the Hilfkreuzer were members of the Kriegsmarine. They did have naval uniforms, and although they practiced deceptive tactics to get close to ships, they would run up the Kriegsmarine flag, at least ostensibly, on pretty much all occasions before engaging in actual combat. So when a Hilfskreuzer was destroyed, if it was destroyed in a position where the Allies were able to rescue survivors, they were afforded the same status as any other prisoner of war because they'd fought under military flag, they were, as I say, ranking various members of the Kriegsmarine, and they had forms of identification or uniforms to that effect. So they were treated the same as if they, the Allies had managed to sink a German cruiser or similar. Celtic Ogham123 asks, during the Yamato's final stand, why did it not last nearly as long as her sister ship Musashi, as they were similar ships? Well, it's a fairly valid question, especially considering that Yamato's anti-aircraft battery was considerably stronger than Musashi's was when she was sunk. But when you look into the details, there are a number of critical factors. Firstly, Yamato was simply attacked by more aircraft than Musashi was. Total number of sorties flown against Kurita's forces on the day of the Battle of the Sibuyan Sea are just over half those flown against Yamato during Operation Tengo. So more aircraft arriving in greater numbers, you know, that means there's going to be a lot more damage done much quicker. Secondly, the escort forces of the two battleships were quite different. For Operation Tengo, Yamato only had a screen of destroyers with the odd light cruiser, whereas for the Battle of Sibuyan Sea, Musashi had, well, there was Yamato in the vicinity as well, plus various other Japanese cruisers, destroyers, and battleships, as well as some Congos. So 
overall, the US pilots had a greater number of targets, and also those targets had a considerably greater anti-aircraft firepower, which would obviously disrupt and divert some of the attackers. And as we said, there weren't quite as many of them at the Battle of the Sibian Sea anyway. Then you factor in the final major issue, which is that Yamato was the second of the two Yamato class to be sunk. When Musashi had been hit, she ended up taking hits both from bombs, obviously, but also from torpedoes on the left and the right on port and starboard. So she was hit by numerous torpedoes, but the flooding overall was approximately even, and she settled gradually as she lost buoyancy. Whereas with Yamato, she was targeted almost exclusively down one side, not entirely, but almost, and that meant that although the overall amount of flooding at the time that she sank was probably actually slightly less than that suffered by Musashi, because it all happened on one side, she rolled over and capsized before she could just generically founder. And so all of these things worked against her. She had a much more targeted attack that meant she was much more likely to go down with less water in her. She had more aircraft coming after her, and those greater numbers of aircraft had less opposition to deal with when it came to making their attack runs. Next we have, was there ever a case where a merchant raider actually passed visual inspection successfully, and are there any records of how they did it? Well, it depends how you define visual inspection. If you mean by someone stopping boarding them, checking them out, not so much, at least from World War I, World War II. But in terms of a warship giving them a once-over from a distance or an aircraft giving them a once-over from a distance, yes, merchant raiders did actually quite often pass those kinds of inspections. They preferred not to because, obviously, every time they did that, there was a risk of discovery. But the reason we hear quite often about when they failed to pass a visual inspection was because that usually led to some kind of battle, and, you know, people like hearing about battle, so those are things that get written about. But the majority of encounters between merchant raiders and uh, sh warships or aircraft, when they're not just, you know, full-on merchant cruisers, where there is a, there's a slight difference there, then they those would usually actually pass. Uh, one of the Hills crews in the video that uh, I did um, manage to pass inspection from an uh, aircraft that was looking down on them and genuinely thought they were a friendly cargo vessel. The difference, I say, between a raider and a cruiser is that an armed merchant cruiser classically is a naval auxiliary and is usually operating alongside or in close conjunction with actual naval vessels. So you might think of something like the Otranto from the Battle of Coronel. Those ships, obviously, or something like the Carmania, are going to be carrying their guns openly. So they're obviously not going to pass any visual inspection, but they don't intend to, whereas an armed merchant raider, which is what the Hilfskreuzer were, will try and conceal their weaponry at all times, up till the point where they feel they have to unleash the weapons on whatever target they've picked. Contact Alias asks, I've noticed that in a lot of depictions of Age of Sail ships, and those preceding the classic Age of Sail, the hulls appear to be very curved, and in many depictions the gun ports seem to follow the curvature of the decks. However, in some of these images, the curvature of the decks is so severe that the bow and stern portions of a deck might actually be higher than the midship section of the deck just above it. It would appear that later in the Age of Sail, ships' hulls lost their curvature and the decks appear to be more level from bow to stern. How much of the curvature of ships' decks is due to artistic license? There's sometimes a little bit of artistic license involved, but for a lot of what you might call early Age of Sail ships, i.e. in naval terms, sort of 15th, 16th century, going through to parts of the 17th and once you get into the classic age of sail, not so much, but even maybe even then in some of parts of the 18th, it's not actually much artistic license that's being taken. So you can see here Vasa from my trip there, more videos on Vasa to come later, 
and you can see there is quite the definite curvature to the hull and yes the gun ports are following the hull and there's a rather nice uh, cross section through the ship well not through the ship itself but through a model of the ship elsewhere in the museum that shows that yes in fact the decks do curve and when you look at the Mary Rose in Portsmouth that has the same kind of effect albeit a bits and pieces of Mary Rose are missing so you can't see the full effect but you can actually see that again the deck does curve and as ships actually got longer this becomes more pronounced it tends to be much more pronounced in the stern of ships than at the bows there might be a slight ramp up at the bow but it's usually the stern section where you see the greatest slopes and there's a number of reasons for that the methods of building and the style of building change over the age of sail approaching up to the napoleonic wars and beyond and that's not just necessarily style as in appearance it's also style as in the types of timber that are used and the structure that is used so by the time you get to immediately after the napoleonic wars so you're into the last 20 30 years of the age of sail uh, in terms of wooden warships navally you are now looking at a period when actually for a lot of navies long timbers are in short supply so they're building with short timbers so they're forced to use cross bracing and the other such developments which you see people like seppings and simmons coming up with and those result in a much straighter profile of vessel and a lot of this in a lot of the earlier ships especially when you look at the either replicas or occasionally bits of surviving ships from perhaps even earlier than Vasa when you look at say the Golden Hind replica is in part because of the complex geometry of wooden shipbuilding so you've got your frames and the frames go up but when you are then attaching the planks to the frames in order to make up the hull those planks will have been cut straight but when you are attaching them to the frames because each frame obviously is a different size gets narrower and in a lot of cases towards the stern gets taller etc you are having to bend those planks into a curve and if you bend something straight into a three-dimensional curve you end up with a sweep up or a sweep down it's not impossible but incredibly difficult and not very cost effective to pre-cut a plank into a complex three-dimensional curve in the opposite direction so that you can then have the curve sweeping up but the the two sweeps counteracting each other and then getting it nice and straight and so a lot of shipbuilding you would end up with these curving decks when the hull is getting particularly narrow which happens obviously more towards the bow and stern one of the major innovations towards the end of the age of sail say in the late very 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 late 18th and mostly early 19th centuries is curved bows and sterns of the sepping simmons advance era which allow you to just continue the planks going straight around rather than having to follow these complex sweeps Joshua S. asks, I've been wondering what your thoughts of US dreadnought battleships of World War One, i.e. the standard type battleships, are. They seem fairly powerful for their time despite their lower speed. How would you rate them against other ships of other navies when they're first constructed? The standard types, for me, they have a bit of a weird relationship with me. As many of you will know, the New Mexico class, which is one of the standard types, is actually one of my favorite types of battleship ever um, in just all-round appearance looks capabilities etc the concept of the standard class i.e a battle line that is uniform speed uniform maneuvering characteristics and nearly uniform armament therefore making you know battle maneuvers a lot simpler does have a lot of benefits and plus points to it you can't really fault it on that and a number of standard type battleships are excellent products of their time again can't really fault them on that there are things that you can pick them up on where you can put them at fault some of them are transient like the fact that when they were kind of the u.s battle line their gunnery was pretty actually pretty appalling um, when the sixth battle squadron showed up it took them a while to get up to the standard of the grand fleet 
but that's a transient issue that's not so much to do with the ships themselves as it is to do with the amount and type of practice the crews received although there were some issues with some of the turrets having their guns a little bit too close together but again a soluble problem the cage masts again as most of you will know i am not a big fan of they don't work um, they don't fulfill their objectives the only times they actually function as vaguely useful platforms for fire control equipment at speed is when you massively overbuild them on something like say the colorado class at which point they're actually heavier bulkier and take up more space than a tripod mast does so you might as well have gone with a tripod mast from the beginning their concept of a uniform battle line speed as i said is pretty good the actual speed of 21 knots is kind of a mixed bag they are about midway for for the larger fleets for the time period again world war one the german battle line for example contains a number of pre-dreadnoughts at least up until the latter part of 1916 and even after that has the nassaus and the helgelands which means that the german battle lines overall speed unless they like to get themselves strung out is actually slower than the standards battle line speed albeit obviously in world war one period the u.s would have its own slower ships along to a certain degree although they were fairly quick about ditching the south carolinas so they're probably still a bit faster than the german battle line on the other hand the british battle line is a little bit faster because although both sides slowest ships are ostensibly 21 knotters the british have an all turbine dreadnought battle line which means they can sustain that speed for longer at running at top speed and of course the british do have a number of ships in fairly large quantities that can sustain 22 23 24 or in some cases maybe even 25 knots of speed with you know perhaps with the wind behind them which means that then you have this prospect of okay not all of the british battle line can keep up but something like the revengers and the queen elizabeth's operating together can offer a fairly substantial force that's actually faster so this is one of the drawbacks of the standard type is that once everyone starts advancing their battle line speed or their battleship class speed beyond 21 knots you're left with either do we abandon the uniform performance of the standard types or do we keep up with the speed and this is a bit of a catch-22 they are of course very well protected and as a type they bring in the all or nothing armor scheme their torpedo defense isn't great but then again it's world war one battleship no one's torpedo defense is particularly great at that point the single largest problem when it comes to compare and contrasting them with other battleships is that the vast majority of the u.s standard standard battle line doesn't have a direct comparison because of World War I, battleship building and design efforts were interrupted to varying degrees amongst the various other powers. So when you look at the two main contenders for, you know, top dog in naval terms, i.e. Germany and Britain at the time, the Koenig and Revenge classes, well actually, no, more accurately, the Revenge and the Bayern classes, are effectively products of 1913 the first ships of the class are laid down at 1913 their designs are frozen late 1912 early 1913 when you compare that to the american standards okay so you can compare and contrast the nevadas perhaps with the queen elizabeth's where they probably don't come off too well um and the koenigs where they probably come off a little bit better then you're comparing the Pennsylvanias with the Revenges and with the Bayerns. But then once you get into the New Mexicos and the Tennessees, you don't have any contemporary battleships that are being built to, you know, put them up against. So you can make arguments about, well, the Tennessee class is superior to this, that, or the other German or british battleship because this is and this it's like well yes that you might have an argument depending on what particular aspect you're looking at but at the same time the tennessee class is a battleship class that's laid down in 19 late 1916 and 1917 i.e it's a battleship class that's had 
about three years more design experience in an era where three years of design experience takes you from the early the very early first generation dreadnoughts through to the first super dreadnoughts so the fact that the tennessees might have some advantages <laughs> over ships designed three or four years before them is not exactly rocket science but it also means you know there isn't a direct comparison there you can look at some of the on paper sketch designs but they are on paper sketch designs they didn't go through the final process of you know actually building them and working out what worked and what didn't uh, you've got some other navies that are still building warships from smaller navies but they tend to also have long design processes so that's not necessarily perhaps a fair comparison and then of course you get to the last standard type um well, loosely standard type because they're not using exactly the same armament but the colorado class and with the colorado class again it's not even a, a fair contrast because whilst for the new mexico's and the tennessees they've got the advantage of time built uh, design work done after everybody else has kind of paused on building battleships for the colorados which are the battleships of the late 1910s shall we say considering that they're laid down over about a three-year time period they are they have the opposite problem in that they are most directly contrasted with the nagato and nelson types both of which were laid down somewhat later than they were and therefore it's the japanese and the british types in those cases that have a slight advantage when it comes to you know technological advancement in terms of battleship design so direct comparisons between the core of the standard class battle line and everybody else are a little bit difficult but overall you know small issues like inaccurate guns because of too tight spacing etc which again can be solved those small issues aside the general concept and execution of the standard class is overall pretty good with the uh, if i was asked to identify one major weak point within the standard class design principles it would be the engines um the the decision to stick with a 21 knot battle line perhaps went on a little bit longer than it should have done and the variety of different engine types that were experimented with whilst again they did have advantages and disadvantages overall doesn't really do them that many favors compared to what could have been done with you know just a, a slightly more simple decision to go no we're sticking with geared turbines all the way through mikhail erisman asks did the germans actually put the captured port of narvik to use couldn't the allies intercept any ships or convoys from narvik heading back to germany the answer is yes they did put the port of narvik to use in two manners one the fjord as a general rule was used to host german vessels of the kriegsmarine at various points especially because during certain elements of the war narvik was beyond the range of allied bombers to get to that did change later on but it was useful while it lasted there were also still iron ore shipments passing through narvik and heading down towards germany um obviously swedish iron ore now it's interesting because before the war N swedish iron ore exports via narvik made up a far larger percentage of the overall numbers of swedish exports um for their iron ore and iron ore products whereas during the war although the amount was still considerable a uh, well over a million tons approaching even two million tons at one point during the war as a percentage of the total amount of iron ore that sweden was exporting it actually dropped the highest percentage during the war was about 25 percent whereas it had been over 50 percent before the war so there, there and obviously all, all of this was now going to germany so they did make use of it for, for those purposes as well as far as the allies intercepting it that's a bit more difficult german ore shipments via narvik in say 1939 1940 yes those could be fairly easily intercepted once the germans have taken over norway however and they have warships u-boats aircraft etc all based in norway 
then as long as those convoys stay relatively close to the Norwegian coast, they're under a lot of protection and any Allied raiding forces would have to go through a lot of German forces to get to them. So it's one of those things, yes, technically the Allies could send aircraft or submarines or ships to intercept convoys from Narvik heading back to Germany, but it would be a very costly effort if they tried. Bilbo asks, could you explain a little more about shipborne radar and its evolution, more specifically how this affects the ability to detect other vessels? How much did different navies rely on radar for spotting during World War II and up to the Cold War, and how was the float plane affected? So I have talked about this briefly before, but in the specific context of ship spotting, you can effectively look at three phases. You can may maybe add a fourth, but probably three phases for looking at ship detection via radar in World War II. Apart from, you know, the phase where you don't have any. You then have the first generation radar. Now, first generation radar normally is air search radar, so it doesn't specifically have a ship spotting function. It might be able to be used in this role, but that is very much kind of a secondary fudge factor role. And in this, you're not going to get all that much information. It's not going to be particularly long range either. It's basically going to be, well, there's something in this direction at approximately this range. Then you have the first dedicated surface search radars. Now, that will give you a much better idea of the size of the contact, the distance of the contact, and maybe some information about its speed and direction, depending on how the echo is changing compared to your own course and speed. The main restriction with this kind of early surface search radar is, again, range. So it can see through fog, it can see through rain, it can see through darkness, all things that, you know, humans are notoriously not particularly brilliant at. But the range is somewhat limited. It's not up out to the horizon levels of detection but it's some slightly better than the best night visual night aids that they have at the time so when you look at say the Guadalcanal campaign you'll tend to see that even in cases where the radar information is ignored even the earlier US surface search radar is able to pick up the Japanese ships usually a little bit before the Japanese spot the Americans. So they do have that kind of advantage. Obviously you have to use it for that to be of any good to you, but nonetheless. And similarly, when you're talking about an action like uh, Cape Matapan, it's dark enough, conditions are bad enough visually, that the British ships, although they do have their own night fighting doctrine that's also based around optical search from the interwar period, they can see further and more accurately with their radar, but again it doesn't go out quite as far. So at one point they spot a light on the horizon. That light was almost certainly the main Italian force with Vittorio Veneto, but the radar couldn't reach out far enough to tell them what was out there and the distance was too far for them to identify anything visually. Whereas further closer in in some of the other actions at Matapan, the radar gave them advanced warning before either side spotted each other visually. So this is kind of your first gen surface search radar. And then you have the third phase, and this is where radar fidelity in terms of you know accuracy of contact with uh, the ships, again, size, speed, direction, etc. All of that gets better, and the range gets considerably better. So now you are talking in optimal conditions possibly out to the horizon, maybe, or a good chunk of the way to the horizon, depending on the exact nature of the radar and the exact nature of the installation. Because obviously a radar, if you've got the radar of the same capability, but it's mounted lower on a ship or just physically lower because the ship itself is smaller, it's not going to be able to see as far as it could be if it was mounted really high on, say, a battleship or a carrier. But equally, mounting it low might mean that its horizon is obviously closer which means it might be a to the horizon radar whereas if you stick it another 50 foot further up um, it might well not be a to the horizon radar 
but that's kind of semantics it's that third phase this is when you start to see radar really coming into its own and it's used to confirm all sorts of things um, night operations get a lot easier for the ships that have it and it's even used in daytime uh, you know for not completely as a replacement for but as a good healthy supplement to visual spotting especially in cases where you know visual spotting might be at risk of degradation from sunrise sunset um, haze or all those kinds of things in terms of how it affected the float plane the float plane did eventually get replaced by radar but it was only when you got to that kind of third level of near enough horizon distance radar and even then it wasn't strictly a willing sacrifice it was more the fact that ships only had a limited amount of capacity to carry heavy weights topside and by the time you were talking about that level of surface search radar you've also got gunnery control fire control radar air, more advanced air search radar air di directing radar and so on and so forth so you've got an awful lot of these systems they need space they need weight they need margins of your stability and since they're doing a lot of the general spotting jobs that air spotter aircraft and float planes might well have done before you have a little bit of overlap and the float planes would be gone but during the first and second stages the float planes remained because they could still spot considerably further than those earlier radars and even when you're talking about the later radars a float plane can fly a lot further than your horizon is and of course you can get direct verbal feedback so float planes still have quite a considerable use well into world war ii and even towards the end of the war even though they are gradually being eliminated in various fleets to make way for radar because as i say they have over the horizon capabilities that radar just doesn't have and even within the horizon terrain if you're operating off the coast can cause some quite significant issues to radar of world war ii no matter how advanced it is and so again float planes with the human eyeball slightly less affected by that and even in even more detail when you go into harbors and things like that like say the attack on casablanca if there's a fairly large arm of the harbor then radar can't physically see through that but a float plane flying around can see over that to help direct gunfire and as for how much different navies relied on radar it depended almost entirely on how advanced a navy had its radar at any given time period and also how many radars it could manufacture so the u.s navy for example became quite heavily dependent on radar but that's because it had some of the best radars of world war ii by the end of the war and it could manufacture an awful lot of them the british also had some other radars that were also some of the best of the time period british and american radars were stronger and weaker in slightly different areas but they couldn't manufacture quite as many of them so they would prioritize so their larger ships tended to get their latest and greatest radars and so they could begin to move away from scout aircraft but some of the smaller ships either would have to make do with older radar or they would actually be delayed until they could get their hands on some kind of radar set this is one of the reasons the battle class destroyers didn't see any action even though they were as hulls ready a lot sooner than the end of world war ii and you kind of follow this dropping off trend as you go through germany italy japan etc again depending on quality of radar and how many they have available to deploy saitani123 asks was there any plan to refloat or re-equip tirpitz after its sinking no there were no such plans uh well for one thing germany couldn't afford to and also didn't have anything like the equipment to salvage tirpitz at that point in the war or indeed to be honest given where it went down probably ever at that in world war ii and secondly the ship had been hit by at least two possibly three tall boys there were some fairly big chunks of it missing and that's before we get into the internal explosions and fires that occurred whilst the ship was in the process of capsizing and then of course you know it capsized so that's going to damage and destroy quite a lot of internal stuff that you really don't want to um, have damaged or destroyed and that's before incidental shock damage from all the tall boys that landed nearby it so 
yeah, it would have probably cost considerably more to make some kind of vain effort to salvage the ship and take it away for refitting than it would to just build another one. And to be honest, even if you spent that kind of money, there's a fairly high chance the ship would just break or irretrievably wreck itself further if you tried to salvage it. Bob Sampleton asks, why did battlecruisers effectively disappear after Jutland? Despite their weaknesses, the concept seems to be relatively sound, and many of the explosions were down to faults in practice rather than faults in design. The simple answer is that battlecruisers didn't disappear. In fact, if anything, they actually showed up in even greater numbers. Because before the Battle of Jutland, the only people building battlecruisers in any significant way were Britain and Germany, with a late entry by Japan getting the Congos. Everyone else had looked at battlecruisers, but for varying reasons, mostly budgetary, had not actually built any. The Russians were in the process of trying to build a set, but they never completed them. Whereas after Jutland, you had the Russians continuing with their efforts, the French and the Italians both looking at, but although they dropped some fairly detailed designs deciding not to go with them, the Japanese, of course, continue with the Congos, the British redesign Hood and are working on redesigning the Admirals, of Renown and Repulse are already under construction, the Germans have the Mackensons going, but they also cancel some of those, reorder them as Erzatz York, so they're continuing with their battle cruiser building trend. The Americans, once they have Congress giving them a few dollars, go for the Lexingtons. The Japanese follow on from the Congos with the Amagis and plan on following on with even further battle cruiser classes. And the British obviously go with the G3s in the early 1920s. So actually, battle cruisers as a whole are being built in greater numbers after Jutland than they are before Jutland. The main thing is that battle cruiser design is diversifying quite a lot, and it gets harder and harder to pin down exactly what is and isn't a battle cruiser by the time of the early 1920s, because in at the time of the Battle of Jutland, you have the German idea of fairly well protected, reasonably fast uh, of sh battle cruisers, but they're sacrificing on firepower. The British battle cruisers, by and large, are emphasizing speed and firepower over armor, although that's a very crude measurement because comparing the Invincibles or the Indefatigables with the Lions and Tiger and so on is a little bit disingenuous to lump them all together, but as a rough calculation, it serves. Whereas once you go through to the 1920s, you have obviously Germany's out of the picture at this point because of the end of World War One. But when you look at what the Americans are planning, lots of firepower, incredibly high speed and effectively no armor for the size of guns that are being thrown around at that point. You've got the Japanese who have some armor, a lot of firepower as well, and a pretty decent speed. And then you have the British who have gone with the G3s for a, a lot of armor. In fact, enough armor that a lot of people dispute whether the G3s would have been actually battle cruisers or technically the world's first proper fast battleships. Still going with speed and a considerable amount of firepower compared to the other battle cruisers. They're all sort of eight or nine or 10 16 inch guns but when the british battleships are going for 18 inch guns the g3's guns look a little bit small compared to the battleships whereas everyone else's battleships at this point are going for 16 inch guns so it is all very interesting how battle cruisers are evolving and how different they're becoming both relative to each other and relative to their companion battleships but they definitely haven't gone away Joseph Nielsen asks, I can imagine the reactions of Kings Henry and Carl Gustav, I think that's the right monarch, when they watched their prestige ship launch and then sink before they're out of harbour. What was the fate of the designers and builders? Was it just a big oops or was it straight to the tower and stocks? In both cases, it was actually somewhat more muted than you might otherwise imagine. Um, in Henry's, Henry VIII's case, with the sinking of Mary Rose, that was in large part because... You know, 
whilst Mary Rose went down in full view of the king, and it was obviously a huge tragedy, at the time there was also a massive battle to fight against the French, which was somewhat <laughs> distracting. And by the time that was over, uh, kind of heat of the moment stuff would have cooled down, and everyone was mourning the great loss of life. So at that point, people were focusing more on one can we salvage the ship and to how did this happen bearing in mind that mary rose was actually quite an old ship by the time she went down um so it wasn't a, it wasn't quite comparable to vasa but it was more fo focused around inquiries and mourning than it was again around particular sort of looking for exacting vengeance on a particular person especially since the person who was most proximately responsible the ship's captain had gone down with the ship so you couldn't really do that much to him anyway with Vasa um, as far as I recall the king wasn't actually present at the time um, and now in that obviously in that case did go down pretty much on its maiden voyage but from all the reports that can be gathered well one the person who actually owned the shipyard at the time the ship was ordered died while the ship was being built so again you couldn't really do all that much to him um plus again a lot of people were sitting there going how how did this happen exactly so uh, it, again it was kind of the more pragmatic how did what how and why did this happen what effect does this potentially have on any future vessels that we have under construction or potentially vessels that we already own and that's a much larger issue there was a commission and an inquiry made about why Vasa sank but everything seemed to take place more through that line than a kind of an immediate find the person who did this and and you know stick him in prison usually because i say because the most proximate person was the captain who tended <laughs> to be on the ship when it went down so probably had a motivation not to let that happen nicholas Ressar asks in the last stand of the tin can sailors uh, james hornfisher states that the escort carriers each operated with a single combination squadron that was made up of wildcats and avengers what was the reasoning behind having a combined squadron rather than separate but undersized fighter and bomber squadrons this has to do mainly with the way that U.S. squadrons, quote-unquote, were organised during the Second World War, at least for the U.S. Navy. Now, these days, we might conventionally think of a squadron as 12 aircraft. Usually, air um, squadrons are actually close to about 16 aircraft, but with an aim to have 12 operational with spare airframes. Although it depends from service to service and nation to nation for obvious reasons. But back in the time period of the World War II US Navy, they had carriers that could operate 80, 90, 100 or so aircraft, but they weren't operating kind of six, eight, nine squadrons like you might otherwise think they should. In fact, most US carriers, Essex class for example, actually would only operate three squadrons or units um they'd all be v because v was the heavier than air designation as we mentioned um in last week's dry dock and then you'd have vb vf and vt bomber i.e dive bomber uh, fighter and torpedo bomber squadron so for example in 1943 and early 44 um uss essex only had three squadrons aboard vb9 vf9 and vt9 but each of those had around about three dozen aircraft, with the exception of uh, VT-9, which tended to have about two uh, two dozen, or just under. And then in 1944, for the majority of it, it was VB-15, VF-15, and VT-15. There was a slight exception. There was a slight intrusion in the middle part of the year of VFN-77, which was a special night fighter unit that only had four aircraft, but that was very much the exception. Um, then in the end of 1944 and going into 1945 you then had vb4 vf4 and vt4 again units designated as squadrons but by this point you know, a lot of disparity had begun to kick in so in 43 um for example in august 43 vb9 was 24 dauntlesses vf9 was 36 hellcats and vt9 was 19 uh, avengers 
But by the time you get to March 1945, or, or maybe say slightly earlier in 1945, um, at that point, VB4 is only 15 hell divers. Uh, VF4, on the other hand, has well over 50 Hellcats, and VT4 only has 11 uh, TBM 1Cs and 4 TBM 3s, so that's 15 total torpedo bombers. So, technically speaking, although VB4 and VT4 are both full squadrons and contain what we notionally think of as approximately squadron strength, you've then got VF4 sitting there with what we would nowadays think of as probably four to five full squadrons worth of fighters, but is still only a single unit. Now, when it came to the escort carriers, which were typically operating in the region of two dozen aircraft, maybe a fraction more, to have two completely separate units, presumably a VF and a, a VT unit, would break the system somewhat, because you'd have probably around about a dozen or so aircraft total which is certainly in 1943 and 1944 standards was far 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 too low by 1945 okay some of the fleet carrier um, vb and vt squadrons were approaching that level but they were still you know almost 50 percent larger than that and so it was much easier to just say okay we're going to have one composite air group we're going to call it vc so a lot of the U.S. carrier-born units were VC, which stands for heavier than air composite squadrons, and then you'd have this mix, depending on exactly which carrier you're talking about, of Wildcats and Avengers, and that could be roughly even or slightly more fighters, and very rarely would it ever be more torpedo bombers than you had fighters, but it meant that you could have this unit of around 20 to 30 aircraft, which fit neatly within the U.S. order of battle at the time of this is roughly how large a V unit should be. And it meant that you could operate your escort carrier on that basis, you could supply your carrier on that basis, and everyone understood what was going on. Whereas if you'd had them divided up into separate smaller units, it would have caused a lot of confusion, especially logistically, because on the one hand, you might find yourself, say, with a VT unit on an escort carrier that only has eight Avengers and therefore only needs the supplies for that and you might have a VT unit on a carrier that might have two dozen Avengers and therefore needs three times as many supplies but if those two disparities in size exist and the only header you've got is VT insert number here that could cause a lot of problems whereas if you have VC, VT, VB, VF etc and everyone's kind of used to them being a approximately a dozen uh, sorry approximately two dozen to three dozen aircraft then by default the approximately right amount of supplies are going to be set aside before any further detailing uh, and looking into it is done obviously once you get to 1945 and the vf squadrons start to be massive compared to everything else that slightly breaks down but by that point everyone has kind of come to understand that you need an awful lot of fighters and fighters are slightly easier to supply than dive bombers and torpedo bombers anyway because they're a bit smaller tend to break less and then we have a question about the contribution and the worth of the work of Jacques Stroschkopf I think that's how you pronounce his name in World War II now contrary to what you might think based on his name he was not in fact German he was from Alsace, so on the border region between France and Germany, but he was, in fact, French, albeit that thanks to where he grew up, he did speak fluent German, and he was placed in charge of the arsenal at Lorient, um, and looking after new construction in shipyards, etc., basically just before World War II broke out, although he had actually served in World War I as well. Now, of course, France fell under the control of the Germans in 1940. And it was at this point that Stroschkopf became possibly one of the best deep cover agents of the war. Um, he said he would stay in charge of the, uh, the naval base, uh, or at least the part that he had authority over. And as far as the Germans were concerned, this was fine. I mean, he spoke German, his name sounded German, even if he was still in their view French and he knew all the ins and outs of the base so 
fine, let them get on with it. You know, and we always welcome collaborators in in Germany. Thought the uh, Gestapo, and he seemed to be the perfect collaborator. He was far more friendly with the German guards than he was with the workers. They thought he was cold and somewhat bullying. And a lot of them actually really hated him because they thought, yeah, this guy is ingratiating himself with the occupiers. He is a traitor. And in fact, he was anything but. He had just decided to really, really, really play the role really well. He was, in fact, passing as much information as he humanly could about every single detail of Nazi U-boat operations at Lorient to the Allies. Um, he was a spy. Um and this information was actually pretty worthwhile because, I mean, obviously, in some respects, it would confirm what the Allies were getting via Enigma. But, of course, it was also information that they could have even when there were periods when Enigma encryption wasn't broken. Which, you know, when, say, for instance, when the Kriegsmarine introduced the fourth dial into the their Enigma machines. And it also provided information that they wouldn't get from Enigma and other signal interception work, because obviously that all relied on intercepting signals while the U-boats were at sea, so they'd get operational details, but, for example, they wouldn't know when a U-boat had sailed. They wouldn't know the extent of damage that a U-boat had suffered if it got back. They wouldn't know what the plans for the Kriegsmarine might be in the future, because none of these things would be communicated via signals. But all of these things were things that Storschkopf could find out. I mean, he was supervising part of the naval base. He could just look in and go, oh, yeah, well, there's U-69, there's U-172, um, and, oh, look, U U-178 has come back and it's got a sucking great dent in its side, right? That's going to be out for a little while, and so on and so forth. So all this information could be passed on. And if, say, a German Kriegsmarine officer showed up and said, you, um, we, want, we want to... Uh, get the, the best and latest updated plans that you have in the Lorient archive of, say, the U.S. East Coast. Well, Stoshkov was not an idiot. He could put two and two together and figure out, well, maybe they want to know something about operating submarines off the U.S. East Coast. Maybe I should tell people that. Which, of course, then meant that the Allies would have information that the Germans were thinking about planning something on the U.S. East Coast long before the first U-boat ever sailed there. So this was kind of the kind of vital human intelligence that you can only get from somebody who is so deeply embedded in the workings of the the apparatus of the shipyard that they are pretty much the only ones who can tell you it and you're just lucky that they happen to have decided that actually yeah I don't particularly like the Nazis that much and I will risk life and limb because apparently they are the Nazis they don't take very well to spies in order to you know let the allies know what's going on unfortunately for Stoshkov, another agent was captured, tortured, and revealed his identity, and the Gestapo arrested him in 1944. But um, his cover was so good that most of the people that he worked with at the time didn't think he'd been arrested. They thought the Germans had taken him off somewhere else to be in charge of something even bigger and better. And when the truth came out after the immediately after the war and the french for rather obvious reasons awarded him the legion of honor um which is their equivalent of the victoria cross or the u.s medal of honor that raised quite a few surprises because there were an awful lot of people like hang on a minute why are we giving our highest award to a guy that i clearly remember was a traitor when as i said in fact he wasn't he was just really really good at um, being an undercover spy. So, yeah, his contributions definitely, definitely helped the Allied war effort. And by all accounts, he would have sailed through the entire war with the Germans never suspecting a thing about him if it hadn't been for this other agent who gave up his, his identity. Ryan Frederick asks... I've just finished re-watching your Jutland series for about the fifth time, and I can't get over how phenomenal your description of the Grand Fleet's deployment is. White ensigns everywhere, signal flags, warships turning as if piloted by a single hand. It's almost Age of Sail-like. What is-r your sources for such a detailed description? The eyewitness accounts must have been breathtaking. 
Well, if you take a look in the video description for the series, you'll see a list of uh, links to various books and other resources that are used for that series. But in particular, if you're asking about you know the flags and the deployment, etc., it's one of those things that's so remarkable in history that it's commented on by almost every major author who's written anything particularly substantial about the Battle of Jutland. In particular, there's a book called Voices from Jutland. Sorry, I'm just looking at it in this shelf. Um, a cent Voices from Jutland, a centenary commemoration, which is mostly to do mostly survivors' accounts, um, people talking about it in the immediate aftermath. And there's at least one other book, which I can't see right now at the time of recording, but I do have somewhere else on my shelves, which, again, is a similar kind of compilation of various um, survivors' accounts and what they saw, which, between those two, most formed most of the basis for the various voice-acted survivors' accounts that you heard in that series. Um, also, there's the Imperial War Museum Book of the War at Sea, for World War One, which also contains similar survivors' accounts. And al almost all of those, as I say, when they talk about the deployment, they all refer to this moment when the when action stations is sounded and there everyone beats to quarters and then all these flags start flying. And it I mean you can understand why. The Royal Navy at this point, they've gone about a century without a massive make or break battle like Trafalgar they have the expectation of that weighing on them. They've been, all of them, like officers, men, everyone from the lowliest rating to Jellicoe himself, they've all been brought up with this idea that they will they will need to fight the big decisive battle. And they're expected to win, they're expected to embody the, the spirit of Nelson, and they've built a fleet with which to do it. So they've all got this pride in it, and by May 1916, they've been waiting a long time because they were hoping to have fight that battle in 1914, they were hoping to fight that battle in 1915, they were hoping to fight that battle earlier in 1916, and it had never come about. Now, if you can imagine, the Grand Fleet's been called out to sea several times. Each time, was this it? Maybe, maybe not. And then finally after so many false starts and so many years of waiting and so many even more years, decades of being brought up with the idea that they're going to have to fight this epic sea clash, now finally they get the signal and they hear the call that, yes, this is serious, yes, we are actually going to do this, we are going to fight. You can perfectly well understand, quite apart from the visual identification issues, why every single ship would want to make a big show of this. This, this was it. This was the battle, and no one wanted there to be any doubt that they were absolutely ready for it. And so you have this phenomenon of white ensigns flying from, as mentioned in the video and elsewhere, from pretty much everywhere that they could hoist a flag that wasn't going to interfere with the signal flags. You had massive battle ensigns streaming, you had pennants, you had flags any white ensign they could find, and some ships, when they ran out of white ensigns, would started putting Union Jacks in other places where you could hang a flag, but you no longer had en enough white ensigns to cover the ship. So I think if anyone gets around to doing a proper high-budget series or movie about Jutland, they've got to include this scene. Um, I mean, I know I reference Pirates of the Caribbean 3 a little bit, perhaps a little bit too much, but, you know... They have this scene in Pirates of the Caribbean 3 where everybody is literally called Hoist the Colours, where everybody is hoisting their their pirate flags. And, I mean, okay, Hans Zimmer's music does go an awful long way to making that scene, even if the overall mass battle we were promised never happened. But in this case, the mass battle we are promised does actually happen. And it's not, you know, one flag per ship. You're talking about hundreds of warships all ho hoisting multiple flags whilst sailing in formation and then deploying in perfect sync. Well, the battleships at least, everybody else was kind of in a bad <laughs> scramble desperately trying to get out the way, but there you go. It's it's such a me like mentally breathtaking just thinking about it, let alone actually seeing it visualised. It's got to be done in, in visual media at some point. Sir Reginald Lee IV asks... 
I've particularly enjoyed your examinations of maritime disasters from a technical point of view, such as USS Cyclops, the Lusitania and the Edmund Fitzgerald. Are there any other civilian or merchant marine disasters that have set your mind turning? For example, the SS Morrow Castle fire, His Majesty's Hospital Ship Britannic or the Texas City explosions. As an engineer, I'm always intrigued by big disasters that occur when some form of engineering may or may not be at fault or could be used to explain why the disaster happened. That's everything from the Challenger space shuttle to random Colombian bridges that didn't have expansion joints to Taiwanese blocks of flats that managed to fall over literally on their side but without collapsing. And as you mentioned, various ships and other disasters. Britannic, obviously lots of questions about why exactly she went down and some of the others that we've already discussed. So yeah, if, if it's a major disaster that has a significant engineering component i'm usually incredibly intrigued by looking into it um, even things like the comet jetliner disasters because there's an awful lot of engineering material to work out there and you know lessons that hopefully people will learn it does at times make me slightly annoyed as well because you quite often will end up with people going off on various conspiracy related tangents about this or that that may or may not have happened or that they claim may or may not have happened and so often it's built on something that it sounds vaguely plausible from a layman's perspective but anyone with a degree of engineering knowledge is just going to look at it and go yeah, your entire argumentative foundation is completely invalid because you don't know what you're talking about. And I suppose, not that this was planned, this is literally just reading off the Patreon questions, but given that this is going to be going out shortly after um, the 20th commemoration of the 9-11 attacks, as you might imagine, the collapse of the Twin Towers was something that greatly intrigued me when I was doing my engineering degree, and I actually did a fairly extensive degree of study into um, since the actual attacks themselves happened while I was still in high school and as you can imagine that I, I one of the main reasons I don't really discuss that as an engine from an engineering perspective either online or, or all that much even at all um, is yeah there are so many lunatic conspiracy theories out there that are basically have been written up by people with zero engineering knowledge or even worse people who pretend to have engineering knowledge and obviously do not um and you get the same thing with things like britannic and um lusitania and so on and so forth engineering is something that is relatively complex but at the same time there are certain paths to follow and certain paths that aren't followed like for, you know, for example metal steel on the britannic for instance is not going to turn into pasta you know it might be of a lower quality it might be brittle it mm, there may be certain joints that are weak and so forth but the yield strength of steel and the brittleness of steel are known quantities and if those are different because the steel is of a ver varying quality uh, made up of you know different trace elements and so forth as well as obviously the main uh, iron and carbon then we can quantify that and we can say okay well if it has these impurities it is going to alter what the ship's going to do by this but it's also not going to do this other outlandish thing like steel doesn't spontaneously explode for instance not usually anyway unless you're operating in some very very strange environments um it's at least, yes you can make steel explode in and of itself but um, not on any environment you're going to find naturally occurring on earth put it that way anyway so yes plenty of uh, engineering disasters that set my mind going and maybe at some point we might discuss a few on the channel Kra f one asks in a previous dry dock when you were asked how long it took warships to reach their max speed the answer was possibly up to hours with this in mind what speed or speeds would fleet carriers operate at to launch their aircraft and how much time was allowed to reach those speeds the important thing to remember here is that you can get up to around about 90 plus percent of your speed in relatively short order it's getting that last little bit that is the bit that takes a long time so if you've got and also i mean it depends on if you've got your boilers lit off or not so if you're starting from a standing start uh, i.e 
boilers cold, to get up to flank speed could yeah, very well take hours. Whereas if you've got the boilers lit, you could get up to flank speed in a World War II era ship in maybe an hour. But you'd be up to, let's say you're, you've are you got a ship that can do 32 knots, you'd be up to 28, 29 knots in 10 minutes from standing, assuming your boilers were lit. And then the remaining 40, 50 minutes would be spent eking out those last four knots. Conversely, if you're already cruising with all boilers lit and you're already doing 20, 25 knots, then obviously that part is covered. So you might hit your 28, 29 knot mark in, let's say, 5, 10 minutes. And then you've got to crawl up to the, the last bit. So when you're looking at speeds that fleet carriers would be going to launch their aircraft this is why you usually see the beginning of flight ops operations in terms of you know the ship in the case of the mediterranean pulling out of line and beginning its run might start half an hour to 45 minutes before the plane's actually due to take off and even in something like the pacific theater where there's a bit more freedom of operation and also escorts have a slightly higher chance of keeping up or at least keeping in the same vicinity thereof the carriers would set themselves up to running up to speed and then turning into the wind again anything up to half an hour or more before the planes are due to take off so you can quite easily run fly tops unless you've absolutely heavily loaded the aircraft down assuming you've got a relatively decent existing breeze anyway you can run fly tops doing 28 knots, 29 knots, not a problem. If your carrier can do 32, 33, 34, 35 knots, something like that, then obviously it's more efficient to be running at your maximum speed. But if you're pressed for time, get up to the 28, 29, 30 knots and start launching aircraft. Maybe launch your fighters off first. And by the time you've cleared your fighters away, then your heavily loaded dive and torpedo bombers that need that extra three or four knots of wind will be ready to go and you'll have achieved that extra three or four knots and that brings us to the end of this week's dry dock thank you very much for listening for those of you who have managed to make it around about the time that this dry dock is going live i will be at tank fest hopefully meeting and greeting a few of you and that's probably all there is to say other than uh, to repeat obviously that as of the date of broadcast of this dry dock uh, Russian and Soviet battleships the book I've worked to republish with the US Navy Institute is now live and up for sale and if you want you can use the code DRAC that's D-R-A-C-H and that'll get you 25% off of the RRP um, if you're a member of USNI you already get 40% off so <laughs> there's a slightly better deal if indeed you plan to buy a number of books from them or indeed you want access to their wonderful archives so that's pretty much all I have to say for the minute other than obviously I hope I get back intact from Tankfest uh, please don't run me over with a challenger or a tiger or whatever in fact it'd be very humiliating to be run over by a tiger considering that the thing only moves relatively slowly these days but nevertheless um, I will hopefully see you in an unflattened state later on this week.